You're listening to Guitar Talk with Dave and Michael. All right, everybody. Welcome back to Guitar Talk. Dave here. Michael here. And today we are talking about many things. Uh, We were talking before we got started here about uh, some people who have passed away Um, Some from the coronavirus and some from just, um, they just passed away. And one of them was Keith Olsen. And uh, we talked about Keith Olsen last week when we talked about Rick Springfield. But Keith Olsen has produced such great albums as Fleetwood Mac's 1975 debut album with Stevie Nicks and, and Lindsey Buckingham. And we know he did the Success Hasn't Spoiled Me Yet record. And you were pulling out some other records that he had done, which was? Uh, Standing Hampton by Sammy Hagar. Oh, great album. That's yes. the album with uh, There's Only One Way to Rock. Uh, There's Only One Way to Rock. Uh, Heavy Metal is on there, which is a great tune. Um, you all love driving love... me crazy? Yeah. You know what? I think that son. Wait a minute. Your love is driving me crazy. Yeah, that might be on there too. I think it's the um, opening track. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? You, well, I'm, I'm zoning out a little bit because I'm thinking of he, there's a remake on there of uh, the Janis Joplin song, uh, Another Piece heart. of My Heart. Yeah, yeah. And they do a great job on that. And um, falling in love. Falling in love again. Oh, right? I'll fall in love again. I that's said it. it's all right. Yeah. With that, me now. It. Oh, really? What was the other one I said? You said, Oh, your love is driving me crazy. Which which might not be on there. That, oh, that that's why I kind of lock box. box. I think so. It could be on three lock box. I, I can't remember. Um both albums are great. I wonder who did Three Lockbox because I wouldn't be surprised if it was Keith Olsen because the, both records have a similar sound. They almost sound like a part one and two. Yep. And and they. I'm, I'm actually uh, trying trying to pull him up. You know what? I bet if I looked under Wikipedia, that'd probably be the best thing. There we go, Keith Olsen, Wikipedia. You know, because we talked about a bunch of different bands last week, and I thought he was responsible for. You know, we talked uh, a bit about Journey. And I thought he was responsible for a lot of a lot of their material, also. Yeah, for some reason, I think Mike Stone was the producer of the Big Journey records. There, the Escape and Frontiers, if I'm not mistaken. I, for some reason, the name Mike Stone comes into my head. Wow, he did uh, uh, Union Jacks by by the Babies. That that's a oh, great album. Wow, Double Vision. Like Union foreigner. Jacks is what, 1980 or 79? Which out? Which year was Union Jacks? 1980. Oh, 80. Okay. All right, great. 19... Yeah, that... And then Working Class Dog, 81. Well, he did Precious Time by Pat Benatar. Santana Z-Bop, which is a really good album. Uh, Success Hasn't Spoiled Me Yet. Three Lock Box. So he did do that album. Oh, okay, yeah, because it sounds like it sounds like a one-two punch, Standing Hampton and Three Lock Box. If he did Z Bop, is Z Bop the album with winning? Yes. I'm winning. With oh, I love that yep. guy's voice. He was like the I don't know where he was from, Finland or the Netherlands. I love that guy. He also sang on the album Shango. Which would also surprise me if he did Z-Bop, that he didn't do Shango, because Shango, again, that those two have like a one-two punch to them. I'm not seeing that one listed here, but this might just be a partial list. I don't know. Huh. What else is on this list? Oh, well, the, the F- Fleetwood Mac. He also did Lizzie Buck- Buckingham and Stevie Nicks, the Buckingham Nicks album from 73 right they brought uh, james, in i believe probably james gang from 72 an album called passing through um the babies pep Benatar, crimes of passion oh that's another great album yep let me see uh that is sammy hagar we already mentioned those two uh, heart passion works from 1983 Oh, Kim good album, good Kim. album. I think that's the album that had How Can I Refuse. You know what? That's a great tune. I love yeah. that song. I think yeah. that's on Passion Works. Okay. Um, 
Joe Walsh, I, The Confessor, Kim Carnes, Cafe oh, I Lacer. Like the Confess- Wait a minute. The Confessor wasn't the name of the album. That's what it says. The, the it Confessor, is. 1985. Yeah. 80, wait, The Confessor came out in 85? That's what it says. Well, I'm looking I at Wikipedia. The seems Confessor like was on the album There Goes the Neighborhood. Now, hold on. Now I got to look that up. Oh, you know what? He did Saga. Remember oh, that band from... Which album? Uh, Wildest Dreams in 87. Yeah, that was after Worlds Apart or Worlds Away, whatever the hell that name of that album was. And, and you know what? I don't know. If we, we probably won't do it on this talk, but that makes me think of... I wanted to do... Uh, you know, have a little talk on Canadian bands. That's a lot of great ones. Yeah. Um... There is. Uh, blues. To, uh, Rick oh, wow. He did guess, Rock of Life. By, I guess uh, the Confessor wasn't on this album. Hold on. What? You bought it. You name it. Nope. An 85, the Confessor. God, I would have thought this was. I would have thought this was much earlier, this song. It doesn't even make sense to me. I remember we were oh, talking no, about the Rock Confessor album. Where's the Confessor? So bizarre. The Confessor. Wow. All right. What was that? Oh, you know, he did the Rock of Life, too, Rick Springfield album. Oh, he did. That's yeah. a great record. Yep. I and don't then think some... Rick liked that album that much. I, he, I Every time I see an article about it, they're always like, it's a dark album. So what? It's fucking good. Like, you know what, what do I give a shit? Like, people are so like, oh, because you're in a dark place, you're not putting out a great record. It's better than most of his albums. I don't know why. Actually, it's very, uh, you know, when you and I talk, talked about uh, what we have, you know, the many topics we talked about the last time we spoke, Rick being one of them, I went back and listened to some Rick that I hadn't listened to in such a long time. And uh, we'll talk about being able to literally hear somebody grow as a performer and or a, a composer, you know, from uh, Jesse's Girl to Rock of Life. When I was listening to the lyrics of like uh, Rock of Life or Honeymoon in Beirut or One Reason or whatever, man, that's. Those are some really good l- lyrics there. And it's great. You know, yeah. You know, and he's, he's, it's not, you know, we joked around a little bit about, you know, Love is All Right Tonight off the first album. It's, you know, it's like night and day, you yeah. know, from that song to, you know, stuff off a of rock of life. I mean, he really grew a lot as a performer. And those lyrics are great. They really are. I, I think Rock of Life could be his best album. It's, it's just very. It's very good. I also think Living in Oz is a great album. I just don't think like when they make excuses like, oh, I was in a dark place. This <laughs> is a very dark album. It's like, give me a break. It's fucking fine. We can handle it. Keith Olsen did not die from coronavirus and and neither did Bill Withers. Uh, but there have been some that have. Now, I noticed there's a crazy amount of love going around for John Prine. And I think it's terrible that John Prine suffered this uh, virus and passed away. I have to say his music never did anything for me. I, I was never, I mean, people talk about Angel from Montgomery, and I, I loathe the song. I, I just do not like it at all. But as far as that, I mean, I don't wish anything like this on anybody, and it's a terrible thing. I just find it odd that people praise certain artists and give them all these accolades. There's a lot of other people who have passed. Um, the guy from Fountains of Wayne, Schlesinger there, I think his last name was, um, who also got the virus and passed. And, uh, you know, some other people that have done some some good work. It's just um, there's like this over-glorification, if you will, I think, of some certain artists. Obviously, people know I, I am not a fan of Bob Dylan. And so um, when I was in high school, and I remember uh, – right after Stevie Ray Vaughan died and the radio 
was like playing nothing but Stevie Ray Vaughan for like the longest time. It was like you never heard of him two weeks before, and then afterwards you couldn't get away from him. And I said to a buddy of mine, because I didn't really mind Stevie Ray Vaughan. I was sort of indifferent about him. I, I like some of the songs. I don't like others. As, play, as a player, I enjoyed him. But I remember saying to my friend, I sure hope Eric Clapton and Bob Dylan never die. Because then I'm going to have to hear their songs on the radio nonstop. And I'm just going to be suffering like a bastard because of these. You know what I mean? And then everyone's going to be like, oh, they're so wonderful. And uh, I was talking to my girlfriend yesterday about it because I was going off about Bob Dylan. And she started saying something about like he won this award and he did that. I said, really, name five songs that doesn't make me want to throw up in my coronavirus mask that I was wearing. <laughs> um, well, yeah, you, you know what? Um, well, Vaughn died uh, much closer to the height of his career, you know, the sweet spot. Um, if Clapton or Dylan died now, obviously nowhere near the heights of their career, and they're not as relevant as as they used to be. I don't think. And and what's making me think all, all this is, you know, when Prince died a few years back, you know, obviously before his time. I mean, he was a young guy, and was he was in his late fifties or something like that, and um, you know. His songs got some airplay, but it 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 wasn't like nonstop, you know. Um, well, yeah, I think Prince wrote an awful lot of material. He was obscenely prolific. I don't mm -hmm. think a lot of it was great. I think mean, some of it is outstanding, and I think some of it's crap. Some of it's garbage. I mean, it's not like I love everything. Some of it's, you know, just middle of the road. It's okay. Some people go off about how great he is, and I don't think he was that great of a player. I do love some of the early records. Like, I love Dirty Mind. I love Controversy, uh, 1999. Uh, Purple Rain is a little... Um, it's, it's good. It's not my favorite. Um, I really liked... Um, the double album he did in 87, uh, Sign of the Times. The first song that comes to my mind is um, Erotic City. I always had Great a song. soft spot. I've always had a Great soft song. spot for that song, yeah. yeah. And I always liked the flip side to that, which was, I think, 17 Days. Let mm. the rain come down, let the rain come. Yeah, good stuff. I, like I said, I love a lot of his stuff. By the time you get to early 90s, you could throw most. I mean, I love the album. Um the Death of Prince, I think it's called Come. I love um, not the one with diamonds and pearls, but the 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 symbol, the Prince symbol. My name is Prince. Album's really good, um, but there's just a lot of crap. And same with Tom Petty. Tom Petty put out some great albums after Long After Dark. I could really care less about Tom Petty's career too, which is why I think when he passed, it was kind of like it's terrible. But it's like you know, they're not getting like the love that Stevie Ray got because Stevie Ray Vaughan. Basically, was like, yeah, I think he was at the highest of his career. He was opening for Clapton. He had done those shows with Clapton and Beck. He was really coming into his own. Yeah, and then boom. So you know, kind of like you know, Jimi Hendrix at the height of his career. Yeah, you know, you know, and not having a lot of material. Where the artists that we're talking about now, there's a, a wealth of material, and they were on the, they were more in the twilight of their careers. With that being said, I really think that I didn't pay as much attention to Prince, you know, in, in his in the later years. Uh, but Petty, I did. I, I what I really liked about Petty is he was still, in my opinion, putting out a lot of good material. Yeah. Um, and and doing a lot of different things, whether it's like under the Mud Crutch name or. You know, they were in the studio. They were Johnny Cash's band when he did his comeback, right. you know, and that and that album won a Grammy. And, you know, and Tom was playing bass on that. You know, I mean, the whole band was in there, you know. Yeah, I just so don't they, think. Yeah, I just don't. I, I never really cared for much of the petty stuff afterwards. I'll say this, you know, it's like when I talk about like. um Prince and I say things I always get these feedback like you're crazy or you're jealous and it's like yeah you know
I don't mind if somebody's your favorite, but when you talk about them as being the greatest, like they're the greatest, like Prince is one of the best guitar players. I have to say, what do you mean it's one of the best? What what criteria is in your checkbox to make him the best? Because there's so many guys that play jazz guitar or that are not known who play, who are just ridiculous, where Prince wouldn't even be the you know, on a competitive level where you call somebody the best. But I understand he's people's favorites, and that's a taste thing, and that's what we're talking about. You say Elton John's one of the best piano players of all time. You really mean he's one of your favorite piano players of all time because there isn't a piano player that goes to Juilliard that's going to say, oh, yeah, no, Elton John's, you know, they're going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, no, I, I I know exactly what you mean. It's it's more like what you pointed out, that someone saying that to them, that's one of their favorite players, not necessarily one of the greatest. Because when I think of great guitar players, and no disrespect to Prince, I definitely, as a guitar player, I don't think of Prince, right. you know. Um, you know, he was, you know, he did, he... He was a multi-instrumentalist that played a, a variety of instruments very well. It'd be interesting uh, if he was still alive be, to, to be able to ask him, what did he think he, in, what instrument did he think he was the best on? Right. You know, because um, he played, you know, a variety of them. But yeah, I never really thought of him as, as a guitar player. More right. well, as I mean, a I'm performer just saying, and a right. songwriter. It's- Right. So when I sit there and I say it about people, I don't really care for Eric Clapton. Some people get like all, you know, but I like Eric Clapton as an artist. I love the August album. That's one of my favorites. It's a great album. And uh, as an artist, singer, um, performer, I enjoy the hell out of him. But if somebody said, what do I think of him as a guitar player? I would say I, I, I don't. It's, it's, doesn't, I don't think of him like a guitar player. Yeah, I would say, Eric, I, we've only been seeing each other for a short amount of time. I just don't see you as a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I, uh, For what it's worth, I do agree with you. I, I never got the whole Clapton is God thing. Um, he's, you know, if you go back in the day, he was maybe in, in, a, in a select group, in a small group of players, as far as the rock genre goes or whatever you want to call it back then, you know, where he was like one of the guys, I mean, I get it back then, but yeah. you know, he's playing. I, I, I don't, I, I never really heard like any like changes really. Like if you take him from early seventies, late sixties, early seventies, and then listen to him, you know, whether it be from the eighties or the nineties or beyond, you know, he's, he, he kind of played the same to me. I, I never really heard him grow as a player and, you know, push the boundaries or, or, or what have you. And, um, you know, I, he, he never was on my short list of players. No, right, but the problem is this, the problem is when you, you bring this up to people and the argument's going to be, he was listen to the stuff he did in cream. Nobody was doing anything like that back then. That's what they say about Hendrix. There's always that nobody was doing it and they were the first. Like somehow that means that somebody else wouldn't have stepped into that spot. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a firm believer of no matter what would have happened, if you took Hendrix out of that spot, somebody else would have rose up from that spot. Now, maybe it would have been two or three years later that somebody did it and somebody came up with this stuff. But I don't think that it's, you know, one guy is responsible. Like I always say, give him the credit for what he did. Don't give him the credit for what you think he influenced because that's such horse shit to me. It's like, oh, you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have um, Jimmy Page without Blind Lemon Shitbag. And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't mean Blind Lemon Shitbag's worth a shit to listen to. Who cares? You wouldn't. <laughs> Everything I've ever listened to in my life, whether it be good or bad, has influenced me. When I hear a bad player, I'm like, I got to remember never to do that. That influences me. That has influenced me what not to play. If I hear somebody great. Now, like, I remember clearly when um, 
I was turned on to Al Demiola's Elegant Gypsy album. Mm. And there's a song, Bodum, what is that? Race with the Devil. And when he starts playing the, when out, when out, when out, and he plays that flat five in that lead. And I'm like, that influenced me. I mean, just that one line. It's probably the slowest thing Al Demiola's ever played. Influenced my playing mm. greatly because I'm like, I like that chromatic sound. Like, that turned me on to something. If somebody were to sit there and then say, Dave, I love the way you play, but you owe everything to, well, Al Demiola because he turned you on to that chromatic playing. And then you go listen to Al and you're like, well, that doesn't sound like anything I'm doing. It has nothing to do with it whatever influences you you know what i mean so i yeah. and i hate that argument about clapton when people like you know, hendrix he influenced so many by doing so what somebody else would have come along and taken that spot and then we'd be sitting there talking about some fictional name that we don't know right now but would have stepped up and would have been you know, I mean, everybody grew up in a town where they were like, oh, man, I know who the best guitar player when I was growing up is. Well, that best guitar player may not have just been stuck in your town. Maybe he would have rose above the... Well, you know what? I've got the name we can use for the fictional guitar player. We're going to use the name Mark Laham. Right, Mark Laham. So if you know anybody named Mark Laham, because it's a made-up name, nobody knows that name. You brought up one of my one of my uh, strongest... Uh, uh, influencers. I mean, I, I, I idolize this person, but when you blind up a blind lemon shit bag, I oh, mean, of course. yes, he's, he's, yeah, he's influenced millions. Do you remember Steve Allen, the comedian? I think he used to host the Tonight Show before Carson. I think at one time, right when yeah. he died, they were like, Steve Allen wrote three thousand songs. Oh, really? Name fucking one. I didn't know he wrote three thousand. Three thousand. Oh. I think if you look it up, look up Steve Allen. It'll tell you how many songs he wrote. And it's like, who cares how many songs he wrote? Nobody knows one. Anyways, on to bigger and better things. Okay. Uh, the other day, I was talking with someone that I work with, a fellow employee. And uh, we were by his workstation. And so I, I, I saw his you know computer. And he had, uh, as a screensaver, he's got a Paul Reed Smith guitar. So I was like... Hey, what's up with this? And he's like, oh, I play guitar. And I'm like, really? I said, so do I. And, you know, we, we didn't know that about each other. So we started talking. And uh, long story short, you know, we're talking about gear because we're guitar players. And gear that we have and maybe gear that we lust after. And it was interesting to see the differences between us in the gear that we have and or lust after. I'm, I'm older than him. Uh, I'd say like, we're like a generation apart. Okay. And, uh, all of the gear that I have or lust after is more, um, used in a live situation, you know? So it'll be like an amp, whether it be a head, you know, and or a cab and, you know, maybe some pedals on the floor, this, that, whatever, you know, stuff like that. And everything that he lusted after was more used in the environment of like a home studio so he could, uh, you know, throw it up on YouTube or something like that, you know? So it, it was a real eye, eye opener for me, you know? Yeah. The opportunity to play in a live situation comes far and few in between now, as opposed to it was commonplace years, you know, years ago, you know, um, you could gig it all, you know, almost at will if you wanted to. You know, sure. but n not the case now, you know, so now the stage is in their home. Yeah, yeah. it's a different world, you know, and also it's funny because um, shit, 15, 20 years ago, people were gigging with different gear. You know, a lot of people using some modeling gear to go out, a lot of smaller amps and a lot of boutique amp companies are now cloning small amps like the Princeton something that's small that you can go to a club date because the clubs seem to be so small whereas before it used to be rock clubs you know you had like cbgb's in new york you could go to the whiskey a go go in la and you can go to other cities and they would have big rock clubs rock venues and now everything's like just a small club you know people are drummers are taking out small jazz combo kits and uh yeah it's just it, it's it's funny in that respect as well 
I, I get I still get messaged all the time of what I'm using when I go on my YouTube channel and I'm I'm using a, a Fender Mustang 2 version 2 amp, which is just a shitty little hundred dollar amp. And it does it it works great. It does everything I needed to do. You know, it's it's one of those things, uh doesn't mean I, I don't like having amps because I, I love I love amps. I mean, amps is like a voice. It's like, do I want to go out and be a country player today? If so, I'll bring out a country amp. If I want to be a, a real heavy player, I could be, a, you know, it's amps I love. I could do everything with the same guitar, you know? Well, actually, this ties back to maybe, I think we talked about this the first time that we did one of these where, you know, the equation of your guitar and your amp, yeah. what, what what has the most to do with the end result? And I said it was the amp. You yeah. know, you know, probably oh, I definitely. Sev- yeah, seventy five percent amp, twenty five percent guitar. And I think you thought the guitar was even less than twenty five percent. I do, I do, only because I think like you listen to like some of those Zeppelin records, and you can't tell he's playing a telly. I, you know, a lot of my channel I play solos, and I did this. I, I did a lesson on a song called "Gun Shooting" by uh, ACDC from the Powerage album. And somebody comments, you need a SG standard with that. <laughs> and I'm like, I could blindfold you and play any fucking guitar and you wouldn't know what the hell I was playing. It's like spammy because you want to see the visual of, oh, you want to see me playing an SG when you play Angus? Or for you, for those fucking golden ears that you have, you can hear that they're not, you know what I mean? It's like, fuck off. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, the yeah. um the visuals mean a lot. Uh and also it's make what you're saying makes me think of something definitely similar is when um when the modeling stuff started to kind of take off uh, a few a few years back, um you'd see these demo videos, you know, by whatever company, you know, whatever the product was. And uh, they would say, you know, okay, here's our, you know, Brian May sound, you know. And of course, they would play some Queen songs, sure. and the tone would be the tone would be close, but it right, definitely, well, yeah, yeah, it, you're playing the it song. Def- yeah, they're playing the song, so you're already in the ballpark. You could probably play through any amp and any guitar. You know, if you're playing the Queen song and you're reasonably close, people are gonna go, oh yeah, that sounds like it. You know, I've had and I, think- now. Yeah, I've done this. I've done this on my channel. I've played Queen songs, and people have said to me, "Oh my God, you nailed his tone." My tone is nowhere near his tone, nowhere near it. In fact, I can't stand his tone. Mine is much brighter. I took out all the mids that he's playing, and because I'm playing the riffs, they hear it and their brain fills in the rest. Yep. You know, and that happens on all those things when they start doing those sound alike stuff. A couple of guys, friendly with them, I see them out on the circuit. And, you know, one guy's a big fan of uh, analog man stuff. Now, I have an analog man pedal, I have a compressor. It's okay. It's not my favorite stuff, but he loves this Prince of Tone. Constantly talks about, so I went and saw him play. And I was just like, yeah, that sounds awful. It sounds, and he came over and he's like, doesn't that thing sound awesome? And I'm like, that's, I wouldn't, not for me. And he was shocked. He's like, really? I, was, I love the sound. And I'm like, yeah, not for me. And I imagine if he hears my tone, he's probably thinking the same thing. I wouldn't ask him what he thinks of my tone because I don't care. I, I, I hear what I hear and I know if it sounds good, what do I think this guy's going to, you know what I mean? Like, what do I care if he says, oh, it sounds like yeah. shit. Oh, all right, well, good for you. Well, well, that coupled with, you know, that's just like the woman asking the guy, you know, she's wearing a pair of pants and she says, hey, does my ass look fat in this? And he's going to, what's he going to say? He's going to say, no, it right. doesn't, even though her right. ass does look fat. So I think if you ask, if anyone asks another person, hey, what do you think of my tone? More than likely, they're going to be polite and say, oh, yeah, sure, man. Well, I think know. the girl says, do these jeans make my ass look fat? And then the answer is no, because you're being truthful. The fact that you got a fat ass makes your ass look fat. <laughs> jeans are just doing its job. <laughs> so you're still being honest. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. 
but um, yeah, I, I think most people, if you ask them a loaded questions, you know, like, hey, w- you know, what is, what does my tone sound like tonight? You know, they're out there watching you play in the club. They're going to be nice. They're not necessarily going to tell you what they really think, you right. know. And um, and at the end of the day, I like your attitude. It's like, you know what you like. If you know if it's dialed into your satisfaction, at the end of the day, that's all that matters, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not, exactly. If I'm sitting here playing in my own band, and I have a sound, and it's nice when people come up and they're like, like when I played in my band, the Big Angry, there would be, it would be like at least every night, one person would come up and be like, dude, that amp. It was my dual rectifier, and I used to plug in direct with one delay pedal, and he'd be like, it sounds fucking great and i'm like oh thanks man and um you know when i play certain things it sounds good for the most part if you play good you it's gonna sound good but sometimes you'll hear someone's tone and it's like um if it's too mid-rangey and they're fighting with the bass frequency and the vocals and that's usually when you go see a band and they're too loud but I don't know. I, I I was watching someone's channel once, and I and I I heard him for a minute talking about how his trick is to turn the mids all the way up, and I was like, I gotta stop watching because that's a <laughs> band I'd never want to see. Because <laughs> um, all that stuff sounds great when you're playing by yourself, but in a band context, you're now shitting all over everybody else's free. You know, there's only it's one frequency range that's going on. So if everybody's sitting in one frequency, it's a fight. Absolutely. And and you know what? guitar guitar is a mid-range instrument and that's why singers, you know, it's it's their favorite thing to hate is the guitar right. player because you're you're trying to occupy the same space for the most part, you know. So you got to find a way to 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 coexist. Well, and, usually what you got to do is pull out the mid out of that guitar and slide if you take if you go on youtube and look up any band where it says isolated guitar tracks like whether it's paul koshoff or it's any any of these players eddie van halen and listen to that guitar after it's coming through the mix and they pulled out the guitar Mm -hmm. you're gonna be like that is a thin sounding guitar absolutely absolutely and i i um and I'm I'm guilty of this too. Uh, you know, it's very easy if you're at home by yourself and you're playing to fatten things up too much, yes. too much low end and too much low mids, and uh, it sounds great, you know, because you're filling up a space by yourself. Absolutely. But boy, if you get in a band, if you get in a band situation, number one, the bass player is like, "Hey, you're you're in my space," and the singer, "Hey, you're in my space," and you're right when you listen to those isolated tracks. I was actually amazed at how thin and um, weak a lot of these guitar parts actually sound by themselves. But when you put them in the mix, they sound great because they fill that spot. Because the bass comes in to meet with it. And especially, um, you know, some bands, if you have keyboards in the band, then the bass needs to be thinned out as well. You want to thin out that bass because you're not going to hear that low to mid in the keys. It's just, it's a dance you got to do. And so when someone says like, oh, listen to this tone and I'm chasing tone and they listen to something and then they play it. I'm like, when I do it, I'll always set the amp and people be like, oh, that's a little too, that's too bright. That's too bright. I'm like, wait. And then when the, I've had it happen when someone come up to me and they want to play my rig, they try it before my band goes on and they're like, I don't like how bright it is. And then when we play a couple of tunes, they come up and they're like, "Yeah, fucking perfect in the mix. It sounds so much different now." I'm like, "I I know, because now I'm cutting through. I'm playing it, and I'm I'm not on top of this guy. We got two keyboard players. We got two guitar. You know, it's a mess. I'm I'm sitting there trying to. I gotta carve my niche, you know. And uh, nope. so I get used to what that sound is when nothing's there. You kind of work that in. I uh, I do want to comment on this because when you said you know we're talking about tone here uh you know my my past i i think i mentioned i worked for a couple of music instrument companies over the years prior to that i uh like you worked in music stores 
okay? And uh, it never failed. You'll get someone that'll come in there and uh, I'm trying to remember exactly how they said it, but they'd say, oh yeah, you know, I'm, I'm like looking for this tone that I once had, you know, and they had it like 10 years ago and they've been trying to, to recreate it ever since. And they had some kind of weird, con- you know, concoction of pedals and or amp and guitar and you know they were in their friend's basement they were probably high and who knows what else and but it was the best tone they ever heard and so they're they're trying to chase this and i'm thinking you know i'm I'm thinking like number one you're gonna you're gonna remember something from 10 years ago like if someone actually recreated this tone right now you would actually remember it number two it wasn't that great to begin with because i guarantee you once again you were high and so on and so on and so on you know but it was just so funny because that happened a lot of times that that was something i heard almost verbatim from different people that, oh yeah, I had this tone once, and oh, I'm, I'm I'm just you know I'm just trying to get it. It was the best tone I ever had. Blah 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 blah, blah. you know. And it was uh, just humorous. Oh yeah, well I mean Sad it doesn't too. really matter. I, I did a gig in England, and uh, the guy called me up and he was like, "Hey, listen, I, um, you, I was flying in the next day. He's like, I gotta rent your amplifier for the rehearsals and the gigs. I'm like, okay. What do you want? I'm like, whatever they got, it's fine. No, 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 no. Well, I, I go, uh, well, I play a Mesa. I have a dual rectifier. If they don't have a dual rectifier, any Marshall will be fine. I, I don't care. It doesn't matter. He couldn't, he was like, no, no, no. I, I know you guitar players. You're going to be very specific. I was like, I, I don't care. Just And so he ended up calling me back and goes, they had a dual rectifier. But it's like the two channel. And I was like, I, I don't care. That's fine. I'm going to use it for one channel. We're going out, we're playing. It's like, I'll dial... I can, I'll dial in and how I need it to sound. I, you know, I practice when I practice guitar without an amp. I sit on my bed watching TV and I'm just noodling about. I, I don't, so when, it, when I hear an amp, it doesn't matter what amp, it, unless it's a terrible amp, which, I'm, you know, no rental place, like, is going to rent you. They're going to rent pretty decent amps. You know, it's usually something tube. If you say, give me a tube amp, and I'm playing a roughly clean sound, any Fender will be fine. Any Marshall will be. I don't care. Just give me whatever. The, I'll make it work. So people, so many people get hung up. Now, when it comes to buying amps, that's a different story because to me, there's um, some value. Like when I bought the DSL 50, it's you know that's a a nice lead amp. Um, it has a certain tone that it does really well. The JCM 900 uh, 2100 does something very well. Um, the I have a Roland Jazz Chorus 40 over here. That obviously does something very well. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? It's like if uh, if if there was an amp company that said, hey, Dave, you're going to go on the road with so-and-so, and uh, we'd like to backline you for you. I'd be like, you know, 90% of the companies out there, I'd be like, all right, what do you, what do you, you know what I mean? I wouldn't care because I would, it would just play the same to me. I mean, if it was... If, uh, if they were looking for a certain sound, like if it was a metal band sound, I could probably name six or seven amps I'd be thrilled with. You know what I mean? If somebody said to me, here's a Friedman, beautiful. Here's a Henning, all right, perfect. Here's a, here's a Mesa, okay, that's great. Here's a Marshall, fantastic. Here's a PV Triple X2, okay. <laughs> Fine with them all, I don't give a shit. They're all, there's so many great amps out there. There is. And so many guys, I, had, I don't know if you saw, I had Brad the Guitologist on my show. And Brad's okay. great. And there's a lot of guys like Brad, whereas if you got an amp and you said to him, hey, can you fix this, dial it in, make it sound? Guys like him and Uncle Doug can go through an amp and do whatever they need to do with it. You know, there's mods for an old basement to make it like a Marshall. There's the Marshall mod in the basement. I just think so much people get hung up on like... um gear i think to me it's it's so much more about price and affordability you know like if if marshall wants to come out with like uh uh, uh if they want to come out with a head from england to me i would say to marshall figure out how you can make a two channel amp out of your england factory 
at the cheapest price you can come up with. Figure out how to make it cost the least amount and put it out. Make it high gain and put it out. Because that's something that people want. It's affordability. You know, it's t- today it's like, here's the J, here, what, what do they call the, uh, the JVM? Here's a four channel JVM. I need a four channel amp like I need a kick in the balls. You know, and they charge you. A lot of money for that amp. That's an expensive amp. It's expensive, yeah. Yeah. Make I don't... A, 20, a 2203 is what? That's a one channel amp, right? Uh, high 22... low input one channel amp. Yeah. What? That's all they need to come out with. How can they make an amp like the 2203 from 1976 or even 78, 79, the Judas Priest years? How can they make that, put that in a box? and not charged what they charge. Do they have to not put Tolex on? Don't put Tolex. I'm just saying that's be that would be something that would be thinking outside the box. Because what do you need? Oh, this one doesn't have Tolex. It, it's uh, you know, we 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 brand the Marshall logo with a hot uh, with a hot branding like your brand will kit and it's a wood box. Perfect. And we sell it for 900 bucks. You'd sell a million of them uh quote possibly possibly i mean with what um marshall fender gibson this that whatever uh, a lot of different companies are in many ways are prisoners to their past successes you know they made this great gear uh that has become part of our culture because it, it you know it was used in music that is still played today you know, and those sounds are ingrained in our heads. We can't get away from them, you know, and they, I, I'm, I guess I'm trying to cover two things here, but um, so, you know, they, they try to come up with something new to keep people's interest, which typically means something different. And so when they stray away from what made them who they are, the something different in many cases falls flat. And sometimes rightly so because it was a shit product and sometimes maybe not rightly so because it was a really good product, but the public just didn't accept it because it was too far to the left or too far to the right from what the public's perception of that particular brand is. That's a tough one. I mean, it's like for me, you know, I'm a, I'm a big I love British amplification. Okay. So I, I, I love Marshall. I love high I love, you know, Vox is that whatever. And, um, I, I'd be hard pressed to buy a new Marshall though. You know, I mean, there's, there's nothing there that makes me want to buy a Marshall. There's nothing there that makes me want to buy a Marshall. Maybe from the late eighties on, except for some of their reissue stuff that they did. Like they did the, yeah, they did that Jimi Hendrix head. But you uh, have the Marshalls, so you're 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 a hard sell, a hard person to sell to because you already have what you what they're offering. How much is the most expensive overseas Epiphone Les Paul? Oh, you know what? I don't know. It, that's changed over the years. Well, know. let's say it's a close to a thousand dollars. Okay. Now, a Gibson Les Paul Studio, the brown wood. And they made it in the cherry wood. A couple of years back, they went for like $700, $800, Gibson logo, completely stripped down. No paint, just brown stain, no binding. But the inlays were the trapezoid inlays. They sold a ton of them. And my point is, is who do you want to sell to? Who do you, what are you trying to do? For me... Marshall going and then saying, we're going to have Vietnam make these amps that look just like Marshall's, but they're made in Vietnam. Are you going to buy one? No. Me? Rick Springfield's <laughs> calling you tomorrow, and he says, I want you to come on the road and be my touring guitar player. And Marshall says, we want to give you $1,000 worth of, of our heads. So can we give you this Vietnam-made head? You'd be like, no, I'll bring my own head. Fuck off. Now. Marshall <laughs> says we're going to make an actual 1979 2203. We're going to use reclaimed wood to put 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 it in, 
and we're going to use a branding iron to brand the Marshall logo in. It's going to be the cheapest made we can make it to get the customer the highest quality amp for the cheapest price, and it costs $1,000. We want to give you that to go on the road. You're going to take it? Of course you will. It. Of course you will, because it's a value. They haven't figured that out yet. The industry hasn't figured that out yet that they can stop trying to go overseas so they can give the same bells and whistles to somebody. They don't understand the world thinks of that as a fake. If if I were to show you this Marshall, where is it? Can you see that Marshall combo? Yes. If I were to take that Marshall combo and show it up close and it said Haze on it, the Haze series was made in Vietnam. You're going to be like, yeah, I, I don't want it. But it doesn't say haze on it. It's made in England. It's the real deal. And if if all of a sudden I could get it to you without the without the clock, whatever they have to do, I don't care how they cut the corners, but they don't need to glorify it. They just want to sell it on the cheap, kind of the way the Les Paul Warren Brown was. You would be selling a lot more Marshalls, and you would be selling it to people who couldn't afford Marshall anymore. The price of gear is a an interesting topic, you know, because if you look at what a classical musician that might play in an orchestra pays for a professional cello, you know, to to do that job or violin or you know insert other instrument you know types, you know, those are those instruments are expensive, you know, like a real actual saxophone if someone's in a you know, a different type of band that would use a sax, this, that, whatever. Man, you, you buy a real sax, a pro sax, it's multiple thousands of dollars, you know. Um, You're I've talking always, about a professional buying it. Um, a professional musician that's in an orchestra is professional. That's their living. But yeah. you're not talking about, so like, here's the thing. Let's say I started a company, and I'm going to call it Dave's Guitar Channel Amplifiers. And they sell for five thousand dollars for the for the amp. Now, who am I going to sell these to? And be honest, five grand is a little pricey. Yeah, I'm not sure oh, who you buy. Give me a price. That, what does what does Friedman sell his amps for? I don't know. What does he sell those amps for? They're kind of pricey too. I mean, you're What's, you're. Give me a half stack. What's a half stack cost? Uh, depends on the head. For argument's sake, let, let's just say two grand because it's a nice round number. Well, two grand for what? Just the head. But let's put the cabinet. So call it three grand. We'll put it three a four grand. by twelve with the head. Three grand. It's who who's buying my amp for three grand? I'll tell you who, doctors and lawyers. You'll never see one on stage. The only way you're gonna see one on stage is when I start giving them away to artists. There's no way. You and I both worked in in, in high end music stores. And so you and I both know that a large part of the clientele was doctors and lawyers because they yeah. had that kind of money. And, you know, they used to play when they were younger. They were getting back into it again. Now they had money and they would come in and they would buy high end guitars, high end amplifiers, boutique pedals, pickups, you name it. Absolutely. And they, were regular, they were regular customers. And that's who we sold most of the stuff to long and short right. of it. Yeah, right. but but I'm not saying that it's a bad thing, and I'm not trying to disparage them by saying that's who's buying it. I'm mm -hmm. just saying is you're not going to see them on stage. If that's who I'm selling to, yeah, because if you would go into the 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 clubs at that point and see what the guys were using, you'd probably see a lot of hot rod deluxes or Devilles or that's something. Why I got a hot rod right. deluxe. That's what I'm taking out. You're yeah. going to see Marshalls out there. You're going to see the new DSL 40s. You know, those DSL, yeah. um, what are they, the clones of the old 401s? Or I think they're a little different. The original 401s, I think, were EL84s, right? That I don't know because I that that, that would be after I didn't like, you know, wasn't right. interested in that Marshall right. gear. Yeah, no, I think the DSL 401s, which were the original combos were with el84s four el84s and i think the reissued dl40s are with el34s two of them which you know if you look at it that way 
me as a player, I would be drawn more to the 234s and the 484s. I'm, you know, it, it's far as power sections go, I'm not a big 84 guy. Right. Well, well they're different amps. The, D, the DSL 401 with the EL84s was not really meant to be for the 34 guy. It was meant to be that combo amp of that sweeter, you know, but they released it now with the, which is fine, but I don't even know where they're making them. I don't think they're, I think they're made in China, but to me, for the price that they sell them, why are they not making something in the U in in the UK that they could make you know a little cheaper? Like, do you need the black cloth? I mean, I'm just saying. I I just think they are missing selling a quality product instead of being in the import export business. They're all becoming art vandalay. In fact, my amplifier company will be called Vandalay Industries because I'm going to then import and export everything from China. That's, That's all they're doing. You know. You know what? I've I've always wanted to be an architect. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, either that, or I want to be your latex salesman. You know. Right. You know. Seinfeld. That's reference. my latex salesman, right? Lying on the floor with his pants down. Yeah, that was hilarious. No, right. okay, he actually, there are marine he biologist was... here. <laughs> um, but um, you know what? You hit on an interesting thing there, and I never thought about this. Was you know you you brought up what a few guitar companies have done uh, you, um, which is like these stripped down guitars which has enabled them to offer a USA guitar but it's you know doesn't have the nicer finish doesn't have this doesn't have that but here it's a USA guitar with quality hardware and pickups um, What you're right why hasn't an amplifier company you know looked at that model and said you know this actually works these guys are moving a lot of units I bet we could do the same thing. Those Warren Brown Studios sold like crazy. And so they did the Fender, like, so did the Fender Highway series, Highway 1 series. Right, where they weren't even pa finished painting the guitar yet, right? They didn't put the top coat on. They just kind of Yeah. You know what though? But that became the popular thin finish. Oh yeah, know? it's such horseshit. <laughs> Unbelievable, but yeah, but, but yeah, no, it, it does. It makes it the highway one gave somebody a USA guitar cheaper. Oh, yeah, and they sold you couldn't keep them in stock, they sold. And instead, these companies would rather let these manufacturers overseas become the import exporter. Who knows, you know, because of what's going on right now with this virus, um, we may see some changes there. Yeah, you know, I, I hope it does. With you know, a, a good cleansing, if you will, that it it wakes people up to be like, hey, why are we letting somebody else make what we make and do a piss poor job of it? Really? Yeah, I mean, because I know um, uh, I won't say who, but uh, one of the companies I work for, uh, you know has had slash has a uh, Chinese facility. And uh, I was speaking with uh, someone high up in the company about the, uh, about the employees. And uh, it was frustrating for them uh, because they, they, at least this person felt that the, uh, the, the Chinese labor <laughs> about the quality at all and i don't want to go into detail and name names or anything like that but i think that there's a misconception that um you know certain countries um uh, you know might have a, a inexpensive labor force but they do like really good work you know um that definitely wasn't the case there um i, I could give you a bunch of chinese stories i do have a couple of the eastman guitars and I never thought I would own a Chinese guitar, but man, they make a nice guitar. I, I hate, right? I almost want to say I hate to say it, but man, they really do. And that factory for a while was making several other brands as well. They do really good work. Yeah, they they know what they're doing. They do. Yeah, and they, and they've got they've got good sources. Like like their woods are good, and yeah, and and so on and so on. And who's ever in charge of what they're doing now with? you know, arch tops and solid body instruments and things like that, they've got a good head on their shoulders. I mean, they're using good hardware, good pickups. Um, you know, they're they're literally doing all the right things. Long yeah, and, and it's a lot different than the Korean market, which 
the Koreans, I thought, were were they had a real fast learning curve. They went from being okay to some of the companies really stepping up, like World Manufacturing became great. Yeah, um, because was, and I think uh, I think World, you know, they were doing the PRS stuff, right? Well, they they did PRS. They've done other companies stuff too. They used to do a few companies higher end um, overseas guitars, and uh, they still do other people's guitars there. They're a really good manufacturer that was in Korea. And, of course, the Japanese have been making great guitars. And I think even um, Indonesia. Indonesia, lot, India. But Indonesia is making great guitars. Whatever factories they got making some of these guitars, you could tell these people care. Interesting. Pro- we, one of them, and actually some higher-end stuff, too, that, uh, that Joe Bonamassa Flying V, the Amos one yeah. epiphone that's made in like indonesia or india or yeah. something like I'm that i'm telling and you that's not, people that's not really take pro- yeah they really take pride and you can see it in the fretwork it's good like they take it on as a craft and that's really important because i never got that vibe from anything from china um with the exception of we talked about Eastern. well yeah well no yeah there's other there's a few actually that was in china that really there's a ver- very few, but China is huge, mm. and um, and I don't know how long some of these factories last. You know, um, the technology there—they're not using some of the most high-tech stuff. Um, you know, it's one of those things where it's only going to get better from there. But I think the best way to deal with them is to not deal with them. I think Indon- I think Indonesia is the market to go to, and I think that. Some of these companies, whether they're in America, Australia, or the UK, if they're making guitars, they should focus on making guitars and not being such the import-export business. You know, I think when Fender kind of did the Mexico thing, like Mexico is really close, and Taylor did it too, and so Taylor was really close to Mexico. But I don't know if it's doing the company a service or a disservice. Well, with the with with Fender, you know, the Mexican facility is owned and operated by Fender. You know, yes, so, right, yes. Yeah, so, so, so they're not jobbing it out. And the job that we used to kick around when I worked at Fender was, you know, they've got just as many Mexicans working at the U.S. facility, right, as they do as at, at the Mexican facility. You know, uh, that coupled with, uh, depending on the finish. Uh, they used to send bodies down to Mexico and, and and they would be finished down there and then they would come back up. So, you know, there was, you know, a blurring of the lines on, on, you know, uh, in, 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 in regards to that. Um, the, you know what we used to call them taco tellies or, or, you know, taco strats or, or whatever. Those were great guitars and a lot of working musicians were using those because yeah they were they were affordable you know they'd yeah. buy those and they typically would change out the pickups maybe sometimes the tuning machines and that was about all you really had to do to them um valley arts guitars okay you know which i don't think that exists anymore they got bought up the brand. oh that's you're right and but i don't know if they're actually making any or that name's kind of parked right now or whatever but when it was really valley arts and it was owned by Mike McGuire and Martin Miranda, and I don't remember who else. It was a you know, whoever else was in on that. Um, you know the uh, the custom pro stuff. The necks and bodies were made by Warmoth, and then they would assemble them. Fin- they would fish them and assemble them. You know, and then the standard pro stuff that was made by uh, Godan up in Canada. Oh, really? Yeah. They would cut those. Ne- yeah, they would cut those necks and bodies. And they were also doing, um, Godin was also cutting uh, necks, maybe not bodies. I think they were doing some stuff for Kramer back in Absolutely. the day. Absolutely. You know, I think they were doing necks and bodies uh, when they were under the brand name Lacido. Lacido. Uh, uh, yeah. Lac- Lacido. I always thought it was Lacido, but it, it could have been either way. Oh, I always thought it was and Lacido. Then, and, um, but it's the same company. It's Godin. Yes. And then you've got, um, I guess even Tom Anderson was cutting necks and bodies for other companies. Yeah. You know, because they had a CNC machine. 
you know, sure. or one or two or whatever, yeah. whatever they had. So there, there were, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. I, I won't go into the rest, but th- there's a lot of that kind of going on behind the scenes. And it's not just guitar companies, it's amp companies too. There's a lot of products that, you know, brand X amplifier company, actually these amps are designed by another amplifier company and then maybe even produced by a third amplifier company. Right. You know? Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of that going around. Behind the problem the is, and the problem with where I have with all this is that everyone's making the same fucking guitar. I saw the other day there was a guy, there's a guy named Steve from Boston. He's one town over from me, mm-hmm. and he was showing a guitar, and I was like, that is a really nice looking guitar. I believe the company begins with, um, I forget the name of the company, it was a four, four uh, Vela, Vela, I don't know what it was, it begins with a V. And um, four letter word begins with V sounds like I don't know a Vela, <laughs> I don't know. It anyways, it was a beautiful guitar, and I'm like, you know what? Then he was telling the audience that it was a C neck, and I'm like, eh, who gives a fuck? Like nobody makes a V neck. No, I'm sure it's going to be the same with this Fender. It's like it looked kind of Fenderish. And it's, I'm just so sick of everyone making the same fucking thing and saying, hey, fellas, me too. It's like, we get it. But why don't you make something a little different? Like, there's V-necks, wide necks. I mean, you can look at Warmoth's site and see they make all kinds of things for every player. But everybody will call them up and get, give me the standard C thin. Fuck off already come on it's like geez only everybody offers that this me too type thing in 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 regards to guitars um tell you what i I have a lot of respect for paul reed smith because he he brings something different to the table you know i mean he's he split the scale you know it wasn't 24 and three quarter it wasn't 25 and a half it was 25 and uh you know, it, it you know, somewhat like a the wide fat. It, it, yeah, he did the wide fat, the wide thin, the the you know what I mean, the the net, which I thought was good. He yeah, that was good. This company, by the way, was called Vola V O L A Guitars. Ooh, never heard of yeah. them. Been yeah, Vola. Yeah. And and you know, yeah. one of the problems I have with it, they were almost all of them were Floyd Rose, but there were some guitars that weren't, and I was I just thought it was an interesting look. And like I said, I, I see it and I'm like no one's making like I like a one and three quarter nut with. I like that wide nut. I like a V neck. Um, I just think everybody's out there making their their like everyone's coming out with their own vanilla ice cream. Oh, we have vanilla. We have French vanilla, vanilla bean. We have uh, just plain vanilla, and we have and it's like some people over here like me are like, can you make chocolate? You know what I mean? And no one well, does. I mean, well, I guess. I, I mean, I, as as um as a man as a former manufacturer, um, you know, you you you're shooting for the biggest target, you know. Uh, the problem so with I, that is the biggest target is already buying somebody else's. In other words, if you're if you're a Fender guy, and you play Fender, that's a big target. But if I say here's a Strat, but here's what's different about my Strat. People might be like, well, I never tried a V-neck. Let me try it. And then usually what they say is, wow, it's different. Actually, I kind of like it. And now you are offering something different for your brand. Because how many times does a Fender knockoff brand come out, made a cool guitar, and then kind of disappeared? Oh, God, there's too many to count. Or yeah, name. That's, and because they're just making what Fender does the best anyways. And then maybe they don't make the best strap, but they they came out with that C neck and even like, um, you know, it's got the best C neck in my opinion for, for, for what it's worth. And I think it's a, it's their medium C I think, um, is, uh, sir. It's, sir makes there's it some, guitar. yeah, man, th- that, that rounded medium C that they have, I played it on a few guitars and I was like, it's just a great profile, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know what he's doing different, but at least to me, anyhow. It was, right, I thought, well, this is probably... like, and I'm saying, you like that scene, neck, So you would be a vanilla guy. So you're in heaven. Mm-hmm. You, right? And you can go to uh, Tom Anderson, sir, uh, 
Gra- uh, Nash, GNL, and then Grosh. You got Grosh too. Right? Grosh too. Yeah, I didn't know if Grosh was still around. Is he still around, Grosh? I think so. Yeah, who knows? Um, but you got you know those that I just named. You've got, um, but how many are making a wide V? None. I mean, go look at when I look at acoustics. Well, you know be- what? You know, you know who offers? Um, you know, when you get into their custom part of the line, you know, it's, it's Sir again. Uh, Sir, when you get into the custom part of the Sir line. You literally can get any neck shape you want because yeah, I, I, when you pay four or five thousand dollars for a guitar, they'll come over and blow you first. I mean, that <laughs> pot's the easy pot. I love when when they say that to me. Oh, you know, if you want, you can order a custom piece. Oh, can I? Oh, that's so nice. Let me go. Let me go rob the bank. I mean, what the hell is this? I mean, it's like, oh, I can go pay a thousand dollars for a USA Strat. Or if you want a V-neck, you know, you can get a custom 56 for 50, 5,500. Oh, you're going to let me do that? That is so sweet of you. Thank you for selling the $1,000 guitar, which has no difference other than the fact that I want a beefier neck that's a V. And that's what sucks. That's the problem with this whole thing. And that's what I'm saying is if somebody wanted to come out and say, I'm making a V-neck and I'm making it as a production model and I want to get all the people that would that cream about a 56 time machine from Fender to buy my V-neck, giddy up. Anyways, okay. today we should call it Mike O, always great to see you and talk to you. Same here. Enjoyed it immensely. And we'll talk next week. Looking forward to it. All right, very good. Good night, Dave. <laughs>